continued from the Thaddeus story so far. He said he would show me the stars. He said he would show me splendor my mind could barely comprehend. And here, in this one place alone, he has made good on all of his promises, because the last weeks have been spent in a place of wonder, a region I had oft heard of, but had never dreamed I would actually visit. Yet our months on ships, once defending ourselves from a ludicrously inept attempt on our lives, has paid off, and we finally arrived. The five hundred worlds, the jewel in the Imperium's crown, the birthplace of legends, Ultima, McCrag. And it has been an experience I would not have passed up for all of the credits in the galaxy. For here, I finally see my master's defenses lower. His shoulders do not hold their perpetual tightness. His gait is wide, his smile's broader. He does not say it, would never admit to it, I had thought. But it was unmistakable. Thaddeus had returned home. I was shocked from the first second of our arrival, the moments after our breaching warp space into real at the Mandeville point. A special guest of the captain, which I can only imagine was orchestrated by my master, we were on the bridge when we translated into real space. And it was only seconds later that near every screen or display on our humble passage liner was screeching the danger we were in. So many target locks on us. So many celestial bodies all circled with enormous defenses, fortresses, defense flotillas, monitors, mines, and many a contraption that would make my head spin to even attempt to describe. We were the center of attention for the merest moment. Yet it did not ruffle a single feather amongst the many crew on the bridge. This was normal. Thaddeus simply chuckled as he was watching my reaction, always watching me whenever I was distracted, always when something unexpected or amazing was happening. I no longer paid it any mind. Of course he would watch me. In me are all of the hopes of his line contained, so he keeps telling me. No pressure that I would be chosen to be the last in a line of ninety-nine Inquisitors, stretching all of the way back to the first centuries of the Orders of the Inquisition. Nope. No pressure at all, then. But I digress. Access protocols were swiftly beamed across, and one by one the target locks dropped off. Well, most of them. The huge space stations retained passive locks for the full duration of our lengthy docking process. The void was filled with ships going to and from the planet's surfaces, all across the system. Huge queues of them outside of the docking areas, lines moving perpetually, despite their size. Efficient. Organized. Thorough. Everything done in its correct time and place, with no delays that could be managed better. But with this amount of traffic, it was impossible for anything to move swiftly so we all reposed to our quarters and packed. After that bracing five minutes, as I literally have about five things to my name, I cooled my heels and read about the place I was about to visit. An amazing place. An ancient place. A realm that had endured even throughout old night. The landing place of the Lord Commander himself, Reboot Gilliman. The stories went on and on. I barely scratched the surface before being summoned by my master as we all processed to the disembarkation deck. And there he was, my master, chatting away with Ursula, Devrin, and Barbon. Devrin and Barbon chortled at points. Ursula was coy, as ever she is when so close to Barbon. But even she was beaming, and wow. Ursula was looking fine indeed dressed in some of the most delicate and complicated lace I had ever witnessed. She seemed like a princess from some picked cast, and of course, she was gorgeous. But then, isn't the off-limits always more alluring, and Stadius always likes to whisper into my ear whenever he catches me casually perusing her? He seems less worried when she gives me that look, 
the one that says if I arrive at her apartments after dark, I would not be the same coming out in the morning, not by a long chalk. She has clocked me, I can tell. She throws her hair across her shoulders in a graceful flick, showing me her neck, slightly more tilt in her hips. It's instinctive, of course. As stated previously, Sadius has taught me all about body language. I wandered up, as usual, and their demeanor shifted ever so slightly. Barbon looks at me utterly blankly, like he does to Ursula sometimes. <sighs> I can never tell if he wants to end me there and then, or wants to protect me from the worst the galaxy has to throw at me. Perhaps it is both. He is a Startes. He is intelligent. He, like most humans, is a huge kaleidoscopic collection of mixed emotions, warring drivers. But he has given his oath. He serves the Thaddeus. I can only hope that this remains the same for a long period yet. I do not think I have the love of Barbon. He clearly is capable of the emotion. His eyes positively scream his affection when he looks at Devlin or Thaddeus. But not me. Not yet. Hopefully, I have time to win him over. Devlin's expression shifts from convivial joviality to a sly, mischievous look. I don't need to be a psyker to tell he is at this very moment planning his next jape at my expense. But then, as he said once himself, best get his licks in before I get an upgrade. How he could make light of the death of someone he clearly worships, my master Thaddeus, is quite beyond me. But then, I have never been a guardsman. I hear that their humor is as black as it gets, and features gallows more often than not. And his licks he certainly did get in, a <laughs> plenty. From finding my left power-armored boot to be his new urinal onwards, it's always the left boot. A running joke now, of course. When not a urinal, the left boot often goes missing whenever Thaddeus gives me permission to have but one night of good honest sleep and allows me to take it off. But this is rare, of course. The components of this particular suit of power armor are complex, but the basic upshot is that they protect both me and those around me. It has a psychic hood, you see. Only recently come into my powers, I'm still considered somewhat of a threat to them and to myself because I have a connection to the Immaterium, the Warp, and thus the dark denizens that reside in that place. Devrin has also been tasked to make my existence to be rather unpredictable. My master again, of course. Devrin took to enjoying his role like a fowl to water, an elder eye to wine. I find most mornings that I am attacked, shot at, have to watch every darn thing in my apartments, on the ways to anywhere I had been going on ship. My realization of the nature of the lessons began when I was walking past two security officers on the ship. I'd just made it round the corner from them when he struck for the first time. He wrapped a long, thin wooden pole around the left side of my head, the side with the reinforced metal augmetics. It did zero to the structural integrity of the augmetics and my skull because of them but it left my head ringing, as he then reached around my head and brought it down hard on his knee. An explosion of technicolor dots spattered my vision as he then pushed me to the ground, my balance shot by a thunderous impact. While receiving a totally unsolicited shoeing, in which I later found out I had lost the integrity of four ribs, the security guards made it back to us on the double. For one instance, the guards stopped and reached for their sidearms, Devlin just beamed at them, giving me a few fleeting seconds of respite as he chirpily instructed them to discuss the situation with the captain. They stepped back and used a vox to contact the bridge. Their eyebrows went up as they both nodded to Devlin and were about to walk away. It seems that in my confusion and attempt to gain my foot in, Devlin must have given them some sort of gestured invitation as both then very helpfully kicked out the arm that was supporting me, then joined in the fun with a real verve. After I was beaten to near unconsciousness, they stopped. 
the guards chortled and confirmed to a jubilant Devlin that they could help him out with his hobby any time he liked. And so it went on. Devrim would not only perform his japes, but, as I found out, he was on strict instructions to make me ready for anything at any time. I did mention this to my master, of course. Master? Yeah? Devrin? Oh, yes! <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's my doing. I feel that you may have the temptation to do a lot of navel-gazing. You know, disappear up your own warp bottom and end up farting out self-serving platitudes about your connection to infinity. Devrin, being the good lad that he is, has agreed to make sure you keep your eyes on the prize, your feet firmly on the ground and your wits and guards high. He tells me you are really improving. If you keep up this sort of stellar progress, I shall have to ask Barbara to help out. Oh, right. Um, so, how long does this go on for? Well, I can't go telling you right out like that, can I? I mean, all of Devrin's fun aside, if I reveal that, then you'll only raise your guard to then lower it when you think this test is over. Ah, yes, I, I, I see the logic. Oh, wonderful. I'm so glad I have your seal of approval. <laughs> and boy... Yes, Master? Although you are indeed making good progress, I am a little bit eaved, to be honest. That's over a score of times he could have killed you in the last two weeks alone. Do better, and do it fast. Or I'll start sending not only Barbar, but Ursula too. You are Ordomalius. Get it together. And that was that. I spent my days on the ship perpetually looking out for Devrin. The ingenuity and sheer patience he would display were astounding. Especially that time he spent two whole days in my closet. The only thing that actually made me approach it was a, well, a strong whiff of we. Alas, thinking it another jape, I opened the door to find out which of my few garments had been marked, only to receive another very swift thrashing. The door swung open wide, as I have to admit I was a bit knocked, and he was straight into me. A knuckle punched to the throat, and I was gasping for air and doubled over. The usual happened, and I was reacquainted with his footwear and the zeal that moved them. He tends not to like punching me in the face anymore, due to my hardened skull. So these days he is well aware that I will be using my face to block and hurt his knuckles. So, the kicking... Always the kicking. But I am faster now. I am more aware, even than I was before. It is certainly working. I now scan every room before I enter it, before the door chime has even been used. I may not be anything even near incompetent with my new abilities, but this I can do. She taught me how to read minds, but advised against it. So surface activity only. But that is more than enough to now tell if Devlin is waiting in ambush. Well, most of the time. Devlin himself may be no scholar, but for a grunt, he is deft enough. Smart enough to turn my advantages against me. The constant game of cat and mouse that is never, ever over has indeed made me more mentally and physically responsive. So I've hardly been bored during our trip, I can tell you. But that was then, and this is now. From that meeting on the disembarkation bay, we took a shuttle down. A small but sleek affair. But oh, how I enjoyed the views as we made our way to the planet. The industry was immediately apparent. The cargo haulers. The myriad of ships going up and down, loading and unloading. Yet the world was not a barren ball of cloying smog. For the air was clean and clear. The sky full of brilliant warm sunlight and fluffy white clouds that languidly glided across the scenes all the time we were there. The wonder of it all. Ultramar. McCrag itself. 
I have basked in the vision of the crowned mountains, both from their base and from their peaks. I have walked the stairs and then inside to witness the shrine of the Primarch, where Abut Gidiman sat for ten millennia or more. I have visited the library of Ptolemy, the greatest repository of wisdom I have ever witnessed. I could spend ten lifetimes in there, not even scratch the depths of knowledge therein contained. I've walked the fortress of Hera, seen wonders there of another sort. All of it was breathtaking. I simply cannot describe it all, any of it really. It may be something I wrestle with for all of my days, the best way to encapsulate this place, this haven, this beacon of light in a galaxy of darkness. But I simply do not have the words, the craft. And as we are on the fortress of Hera, I really should mention what happened there. For it seems that I am not the only one who is to be recharged and retrained here. Barbon has certainly made a splash. I cannot quite put my finger on when it happened, but Barbon has changed. He just seems... more. Again, my lack of skill and description does not help here. It is like he has had fetters removed from him, like he is more free somehow, yet even more gnarly if I am honest. But as always, Thaddeus has found an avenue for his tension, a release for his energies. And it happened when we went to the fortress of Hera, the very home of what are inarguably the greatest space marines of all time, of any bloodline, the Ultramarines. An odd day to say the least, but far more normal after that initial shock. From when we arrived at the fortress, it was not to some queue, not to wander around like tourists. No. For it seems that here in this hallowed place, my master is well respected indeed. Met by an honor guard of no less than twenty ultramarines. And their leader was a living legend. Not that it had any impact on my master, of course. The Space Marine was wearing armor very similar to my own, a psychic hood. As we approached him, ten Marines on either side of us, he walked down the stairs and came to meet with us. A Psyker. Possibly the most powerful Psyker in the Astartes, they say. He eyed me up for a moment before locking his gaze on a beaming Thaddeus. Tiggy! It's been decades! How are you? I really wish you wouldn't call me that in front of the men. It's unbecoming, Thaddeus. Well, a wager is a wager, old fruit. You should never bet if you can't afford to lose, eh, Tiggy? That was a long time ago, Thaddeus. A long time ago. That it was, Tiggy! So what brings one of McCrag's most illuminous sons to the halls of Hera? Deck collecting, actually. Why am I getting the feeling that this will be annoying? Oh, don't be such a stick in the mud. I've seen you off your trolley on Fenris here, young man. Spiking my drink was playing with fire. I should have slain you there and then. Oh, well, spilt milk, missed opportunities. Now, let's save us both some precious time. Here is what I want. Do tell. Firstly... I need some sparring practice. I'll need your best. You think yourself up to fighting a Astartes, little man? Oh, for the throne state, drop the pompous act. Like I'm that stupid. It's for my aide here, Barbon. You bet, Barbon. He needs to get his hands dirty. I'm taking him into some very nasty waters soon, and I need him tip-top. So we'll need a regime. I shall speak to the Master of the Watch. The regime will start tomorrow at dawn. Wonderful. Now, we need to chat privately for the second thing. Of course that is. And at that they left. Barbon, Devrin, Ursula and I were then given the kind of tour that even high nobility would never witness. We were with Thaddeus, so we were treated like kings. Like kings, I tell you. No question was too small or irrelevant, no query unanswered. I had the time of my life discussing the history, architecture, materials, all of it. Of course, 
The other three were less pleased with my perpetual barrage of queries, but they knew full well that we would be doing this until the master had finished in his little discussion with Tigurius, chief librarian of the Ultramarines. It was hours, but I was enjoying myself, so the time flew. Well, for me anyway. When Thanius returned, he had a deeply stern-looking chief librarian in tow, scowling so hard he had a monobrow. The chief librarian looked me over and just nodded at Thaddeus, then turned on his heel and walked away, barking over his shoulder. Baba, arrive at dawn. Bring your weapons and armor. And so we left again. We hit a night attraction and joined the local populace in their revels. Loud music, sweaty bodies all crammed in, and Amasic flowing like water. Ursula was dazzling, and her stint on the dance floor gave her the choice of shore leave partners, I can tell you. Even I was hit on more times than I could count. Then, after a much-needed visit to the restroom, I practically had to double-take when I found Thaddeus regaling a score of beautiful young things with tales of his exploits. By the throne, he could have taken someone home that night too if he had the mind for it. Babon was not present. He was shooed to bed before we even went out. By Thaddeus of all people. Right, you'll need your rest for tomorrow, Babon. The avenging sons men do not ask for nor give quarter. I'm sworn to defend you, old man. Here? Are you nuts? Stop making excuses. It's not like the Amasek will touch your enhanced constitution anyway. And you're not exactly going on the pull either, you Nancy. Fine. But if you snuff it out there in some barroom brawl, I have witnesses that you sent me off. Do what? Does anyone look like they're in the mood for a scrap here? Howdy throne, stop being petulant. I know you're excited, but the faster you go to bed, the faster you get to play with the boys in blue. Show your stuff. Anyway, Devrin is going with us. And I'm not dead yet. Not nearly. So sod off to bed, will you? A tart and an eye rolling later, and Barbon was off. But he had a spring in his step like I'd never seen before. Thaddeus, no matter how offensively put, was absolutely spot on. Barbon was as close to glowing as a black Templar can get, without their faces shattering. But how did I end up in a nocturnal drinking den without my armour? Without the constraint that Thaddeus stated for months was a protection from the denizens of the warp. <sighs> he gave me a drink. A drink he said would negate my abilities, but in a far less dramatic or traumatising way than the grenade. And it did. Because I had warning, because it was slow in its effect, I was not panicked or fearful when my connection to the warp was somehow shut down. Ursula did not partake of this special brew. She had control of herself, so it was just me. And for the first time in months, my mind was calm. I say my mind, as I am mostly calm, but it is not. The constant buzz of other thoughts in the background, increasing in volume whenever I concentrate, but the background buzz is always there. But tonight, it was not. Not any longer. But I did not drink too much Amasek, nor did I do any dancing, much as I wanted to. And I knew why. Devlin. His attacks. I was aware of how vulnerable we were, even in the midst of this huge congregation of our fellow humans. We were always vulnerable. So I had a few drinks, watched Ursula, of course. I have eyes and a heartbeat. But my attention wandered endlessly. I watched Devlin, my master, the exits and entrances, the upper walkways, the doors for the drink receptacle collectors to move in and out of the club, the stewards who provided the drinks, the tall and broad security guards who would not seem out of place in Arbiter's back armor, the endless crowds, perpetually looking for anyone watching any of our troop and making a line for them. Everyone. All of them. I could not turn it off. I also did not wish to. I was aware, and I liked it. 
I liked it a lot more than the feeling of drunk euphoria and false courage. I did not get in any shore leave, but then I took heart from the vision of old Thaddeus with all those gawping young bodies around him, hanging on his every word. I had time for that sort of thing. I had time. And so, our days progressed ever more oddly with each one that passed. For Devrin did not ambush me for two whole weeks, as he was sent off in a matter of import by Thaddeus. Something about gaining more hands on deck was all I could get out of him. And Barbar was all the rage. He'd begun his training well, and now was the talk of the Marines. One after another of them had been matched against him, and each time he had come out on top. I had tales of a true rarity, though. Not from Barbar, of course, but from my master. He bounded into our main dining area, clearly hunting for me. He was chortling so hard that he could barely breathe, water leaking from his eyes at the mirth of it. But when he showed me the picked viewer, I found nothing there to laugh at. Not one bit. For it was silent, thankfully. But the pics were vivid and very explanatory. Someone had been watching Barbon smash his latest adversary with ease when the entire room erupted into a cacophony. Well, I would imagine. As I said, there was no sound. But the Marines all jumped up into lines and saluted, then went into a huge bout of cheering and slapping each other on the back as the Marine unclasped his cape and let it fall as he marched in. I had no idea who it was, but they were of high rank by their markings. It would seem that Barbon ripping through the Ultramarines was not to be taken lying down, and this Marine had come to teach the Black Templar a lesson. But the fight that ensued, holy throne and he who sits on it, the duel was magnificent. They began in the dueling arena, the Ultramarine did not skip a beat as he walked down the stairs and unsheathed his blade while walking at Barbon. Not to, but at. He wasted no time in bowing ceremonially and then immediately dancing into a faultless string of over four dozen interconnected attacks. His blade moved so swiftly I could not make it out and Sadia slapped my hand away from the picked viewer when I went to slow it down. The old codger. An obvious cheer went up from the Ultramarines as Barbon was forced back but when the Ultramarine finished his attacks and locked blades with Barbon, ground hard, and then took one step back, we knew that he had perhaps met his match. Perhaps. Barbon stood his ground and did not advance into the obvious lure. And then silence reigned, and the watching Marines were utterly motionless as they looked on. Barbon and this Ultramarine hero were now circling each other and looking for advantage. Instead of slowing matters down, my master moved them forward so that an hour had passed. Still, the two were at it, but close and clashing. Endlessly lunging, parrying, thrusting, sweeping, leaping, dodging. And so my master skipped forward again, still wheezing from the hilarity of my reactions. I was agog. The counter clarified that it had been moved forward five hours straight. Neither man had removed their helm, neither man had slowed neither showed even the slightest sign of fatigue. And now it was not confined to the arena, for Barbar and the Ultramarine had fought each other outside into the courtyard. And all now looked down from every wall, hundreds of Marines and serfs all cheering on the two combatants. Sadius then turned off the recording, leaving me utterly hanging. My head twisted in his direction, I shot him a vicious glare. This, of course, made him double over in even greater guffaws at my consternation. Barbon literally has no idea who he just crossed swords with. None. They'll be talking about this for a hundred years. Mark my words. Did he win? Oh, no! If you want to know what happened, you will have to somehow winkle it out of Barbon himself. <laughs> Good luck with that, boy. You bastard. Yep, and never forget it. <laughs> so Devrin was busy. Barbon was busy. But what of Ursula? Well, she went in to see her kind. Our kind, I should say, really. We dropped her off one morning outside a sumptuous building of imposing imperial construction. Beautiful but functional, 
as with all things on Ultramar, but certainly imposing. Thaddeus informed me she would be there for a while. He sighed long muttered about a test of her frame of mind and purity, but would not be drawn on the matter. And so, the two of us were finally alone again. It had been some time now. Of course, there was always the training, the sessions of question and answer, tests of memory, perception, but these were work. It had been a long time since we had spent any time together without the structure. And it was silence. But the strangest of silences. Before, it might have been pregnant with anticipation, me waiting permission to grill him about the last activities, the events of the day and his choices. But this was different. As we moved through the air in our conveyance, we both idly looked out. I was wide-eyed still at the splendor of it all. When I caught a reflection of Thaddeus, he was almost misty-eyed. He held a content, quiet look on his face, but he looked every second of his three hundred-plus years there, beneath the light from the star of his birth. It unveiled him a bit more, but despite the lines that were clear evidence of the deeds that haunted him, he did not look frail. Not to me. He looked worn, but not worn out. The quiet satisfaction he had as he looked down around, slowly surveying his world like it was his kingdom. And he started to tell me about it, quietly at first, never with the animation I know him to be capable of. This was reserved, private, he tells me all he knows about each area we traverse, we pass. An inquisitor of his ability, he can transfer so much information so concisely. He really is telling me everything he knows about this place. He never takes his eyes off the horizon and vista while he would travel, never shifts his gaze to me, merely points out what he is discussing, if it is required. And I knew it. There. That look on his face. This. This is his core. This is why he does it. This is how he can continue. He loves this world. His home. His Ultramar. His McCrag. And he knows he will die for it. I can see that now. Then I realize it. What does he know? What has he seen? I cannot help but break my gaze and look aside. I do not want to see this. I am not ready. For I know why we are here. Emperor, protect me. He is saying goodbye. The conveyance goes into land slowly and surely, and we are in the middle of what looks like nowhere. A small patch of clearance in a forest, but not an old one anymore, he explains. It was mostly destroyed by the vile ones. The trees are not old, but they are verdant and lush and wide. Perhaps it is for the better, for young leaves allow more of the light to filter down in darts of yellow like spotlights on the forest floor. We get out and the vessel takes off again. It will return on the morrow, and we enter the forest. We charge for what feels like hours. On occasion, Thaddeus will stop and simply sigh as he looks at where an older, different set of trees of significance to him once stood. We travel in silence. He in front, me behind. And I know I will never forget these moments. No matter how long or short my life may be. For we did not travel as master and apprentice. We did not need to fill the air with lectures and lessons, wisdoms revealed, regrets and loss. We travelled as two friends, 
on a sacred pilgrimage. For I worked out where we were going. It could be no other. It was his world, the world of the Thaddeus. Over sixty percent of them had come from here. He used to like to taunt me. But really, he was just displaying his one not-so-secret pride. He was a son of McCrag, as was the very first Thaddeus. So it made sense. It could only be here. For few think about it, none discuss it. The traditions are so rare now. My master told me, less than a score have passed their knowledge unbroken through the ages. So many slain by the enemy, so few remain. And they are now avoided, even by other Ordo's members, for the traditions are known to be despised by the enemy so much they will send entire armies to slay but one. And if they catch us, if they can predict where we will be, if they can bring us into traps, betrayals, as they have done so many times before. But this is met by the power, knowledge and experience of the traditions. For they are some of the most potent inquisitors in the service of the Imperium, certainly the most effective. And thus, they are hunted. Alas, the traditions became known to the denizens of the Dark City as well and more than a few have been taken by them over the time. But what does nobody think about, nobody discuss? Their resources. And I do not mean those that can be commandeered or commanded by the use of our seal, the authority granted to us by the Emperor. No. I mean their individual resources. The Troves. I had not considered it until we were walking, when he stopped before a mound, a large one, covered in greenery, fresh, alive, but new. He touched a device in his hand, one of ancient design, and before us the mound opened. We heard the many, many bars and locks untwirl as the doors then opened and we walked inside. As we passed the doors I noticed their depth. It was meters. Metal crossbars and pins that were attracted when it opened. It was more secure than any hard point in a capital ship. At that, Thaddeus turned to me and extended out his arm in an expansive gesture of welcome. As I walked in, he took a position behind me. I knew why. He wanted to see my reaction naturally. My first sight of it all. And he was right, too. I will, if I ever have this moment to pass on, to reenact in my own time. I will do this. For he must have seen my feet slow, my pace shorten. Watched me take it all in, as I looked on at the marvel he had saved for me. They had all saved for me. All of them. All ninety-nine of them. And it felt it was just for me. Inside was marble, beautiful and well lit. Images and shadows played off every surface, reflecting off columns. It was dazzling. I walked through the open door so slowly. I stopped after only three more paces. The area was expansive but filled. As stated, columns of white marble held up a ceiling that was like a morning fresco. The white clouds of Macag floating on its surface. But what was so amazing? The plinths, the, well, everything. On 99 plinths were 99 figures, each a different Thaddeus, each from a different era, but all wore the same armor. The armor Thaddeus wore now, I was certain of it. They were made of light, holograms of utter beauty, twisting slowly like vines in the breeze. All around them were smaller displays, that they had light sculptures of such delicate, almost sublime perfection. And that was just the main hall. It was like the images of the Emperor waiting his flock. It was heaven, made real. I was staggered, dumbstruck, slack-jawed at the impossibility of the immensity and intensity of what this all was, what it meant to me. 
and Thaddeus slowly walked up until he was next to me and just beamed across. Nice, isn't it? Yes. Does it make more sense now? And I looked at each of my forebears, the beings they were, not the shining lights of myth, not the dusty shams many think of us all, we inquisitors. They were real, as real as Thaddeus was, as real as I am myself. And they had fought the same battle, waged the same war, unceasingly unbroken, for ten thousand years. Yes. Yes, it does, Master. No longer. What? You cannot call me that now. This marks the end. I spun on him, shocked. But you said I was the one. You said I would be the Thaddeus. You said I could do it. I had to do it. You've not failed, Tarquinus. <sighs> Today is the day you no longer call me Master. Today is the day you become my ally, my friend, my successor. You are not the Thaddeus, not yet. But after today, you will be an Inquisitor, and you will be my named successor. So it's time we discuss this place, what we really are, the traditions, all of it, what we've done, what we plan, what we are attempting to achieve, how we are to do it, and who will try to stop us. And then you will be nearly ready. Nearly. A few more years working together at least, eh? But you have worked. You have shown your mettle. You have fought. You have shown your skill. You have endured. You have shown your faith. Now all you need to do is learn one last thing. But the hardest thing of all. What? How to be wise. I only pray we have enough time. I'll do my best. You always do, Tarkonis. It's why this day has come at all. Because you try your best. You taught me well. I didn't teach you that, boy. Bravery. You had that before ever we met. So, Tigurius, you had him scam me, didn't you? Well, of course I did. I'm not an idiot, and Ursula is no telepath. So I passed the test? You're here, aren't you? I smile and nod. He again opens his hands expansively, and I take the invite and wander. We have all night. So he just hovers at my elbow, ready to answer questions about this or that member, this or that sculpture. We move from room to room, as he shows me the literal piles of Archaeotech, wards, talismans, weapons, objects, and every other form of item one can imagine, all catalogued, all presented. He could outfit a small army with this lot. And then he shows me the book, his life's work. And when I say he, I mean the Thaddeus, all of them. It is then that we are interrupted by the resident Thaddeus never chose to mention until he leapt onto the scene. And as soon as I saw him, I realized that things are going to get very interesting indeed. Story continued in Entry 4, Chukero.